This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, Australia's oldest family-owned salt company. When, you know, you think about a dish that's made, you know, the produce is grown with care, it's delivered with care, it's treated with care in the kitchen, you know, it is up to the front of house to deliver it to the guests with care, you know. It's that simple. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There are people with an innate ability to deliver the magic in a restaurant, driven by a belief in what they do, inspired by those around them, and who find joy in creating memorable experiences for people. Career hospitals, who are at the heartbeat of the culinary landscape, who can, over decades, not only create their identity in the industry, but help form the food and wine conversation for an entire region or state. Sharon Romeo is a co-owner of Fino Sepplesfield and Fino Vino. Sharon, how are you going? I'm um, great. I'm, I'm especially wonderful after that brilliant introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been in the industry for um, a, quite a few decades now and a massive influence on South Australia's uh, restaurant scene. What, what's, it, what's it felt like for you, the, you know, the turbulence of the last year and the vocation of a hospitality worker? I wouldn't change a thing. Well, I wouldn't change my career. I absolutely love what I do. This last year and a bit has been extremely challenging and I feel like I'm more resilient. Not I feel like I'm more resilient. I questioned how resilient I am because if you don't give it your best shot, the doors will close and there's a lot of competition out there and I feel that the Fino brand is strong. People respect it. Our peers respect what we do, you know, we, and we have integrity. And all those values that we have, I feel like we will survive, but far out, you know. It's hard at times, you know, when you've got a, you know, especially during the, the height of COVID when we had to shut down our restaurant. Uh, actually, it was this time last year, so it was around the 21st of March. Uh, we closed two venues on the same day. Most heartbreaking feeling. With the, you don't know. There are so many unknowns. You know, when are we going to? When and are we going to reopen? But to hold your head high and to smile in front of to customers was pretty hard. When there are so many unknowns, you know. Give us a sense of um, what the situation is at the moment in South Australia. You've got a venue in the city and in uh, regional areas. Lib- liberating. <laughs> it's it's pretty. We're pretty lucky here. The South Australian wine regions are flourishing. You know, the domestic tourist interstate tourism is is at its peak. I think still. You know, I mean, we're sort of at the tail end of. Um, the Mad March as well. So we, <clears throat> the Adelaide Festival's just uh, finished last weekend. Uh, I've got one more week of the Fringe. Look, there's there's people are walking around. You know, the, my car park was full, which is a really good sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what well, it is because you know for eight months it wasn't. You know, <clears throat> people are around. Uh, the there's this liberating feeling. I think, and especially in the wine regions, you know, like Sepals Fields, it, it's, we're, we're standing pretty strong there, which is great. You mentioned the resilience required. Do, do you think these circumstances that have happened, do you think, uh, what, what do you think so, as the sort of hospitality industry that will emerge after the dust has settled on COVID? I think um, a lot of re- venues will relook at their business model. I think we have to um, really listen to what the customer wants. I think... You know, having a recession and then a pandemic, you know, I think we have to offer value and fun. As we said at the top of the show, you've been influential for um, just over three decades in South Australia. Can you take us back to sort of where it all started and what drew you to hospitality? The kitchen table at my mum and dad's house. Pretty much a southern Italian family. Uh, we are colour blazer. Uh, it is all about, well, you know, it was about Cucina Povera, which is 
peasant food. You know, we had <clears throat> my parents weren't wealthy, um, but you know the the beautiful dishes mum cooked. You know, and my, even my father. You know, we slaughtered the pig every year, and we used you know nose to tail eating every day. Homemade tomato sauce, just the basic food, but God, the memories there are so incredible for me. And so that was, per, I mean, I would, you know, cook the family meal when I was 13 or 14 out of love. Wow. <laughs> well, because mum, d- dad was working, mum was working, and, you know, it would be a basic pasta sauce. Huck it wasn't fancy, but it, <laughs> it came very naturally to me. And my mother's and father's generosity of anyone that walked in that home. It just, yeah, I think it's innate. It's part of my DNA. When I, I'm so fortunate to own two venues and when that door is open, it's like walking into my home. And it really is. And I want, I want, I want that experience for a guest because you can't get that everywhere. That human connection and the love of pleasing someone you know, even for a few hours. We can get to the incredible um, hospitality experience that you do deliver to people and um, it's hard to put into words. You have to experience the full uh, Sharon Romeo experience in person to know what it's like. But but can you tell us the early days before you owned these venues, uh, this, uh, some of the um, inspirational sort of places you worked and what really key moments in your career? Yeah. Um, oh, I actually worked... I worked a lot. I, well, I started working in hospitality to pay for my uni degree because um, I had to pay for my hex debt. So, but then I just kind of, yeah, fell in love with it and didn't want to leave. I wanted to be a chef uh, at one point um, and that didn't, not that it didn't work out. I kind of, uh, there was a, a male chef that told me at the age of 16 that I was too old to be an apprentice. Wow. I know, but you know, I then went back to uni and did a degree and worked in front of house to pay for that. And then, you know, I I loved it. Uh, worked in a lot of cafes, kind of Italian cafes in in Adelaide CBD. Um, a few notable places. One was a little Italian cafe called Chibo, and I was really fortunate to work with Robbie Cardoni and Roberto. Yeah, he was kind of influential to me he just had this beautiful innate hospitable manner about him and really energetic and I don't know he just kind of inspired me that to have fun and with customers and be yourself I guess and always to strive for something better so he was kind of pivotal for me um, in my career other than that um, working in wine regions I really really loved um but that was what drew me to uh, to Fino in Wollonga. Uh, but I met David Swain, at, my business partner, at a beautiful little cafe on the edge of a cliff at my favourite beach where I now live at Port Wollonga called the Star of Greece. It was a pretty, it was a pretty mental place. It was just manic, uh, but it was just pretty magical. And David was uh, in the kitchen with Michael Ryan from Provenance which is really random. <laughs> but the food they were dishing up, you know, and it was literally squid caught on that beach, you know, like an hour before and on the plate. Like it was just so special and memorable. And I think it's the, the, the restaurants in regions that resonate with me because it is about place and provenance. Yeah, the sense of place is just, it's just so special. You know where you are (laughs) and you celebrate that region for all that it has. You briefly mentioned Fino Wollonga, um, which you had for for a decade. Can you you tell us how that started and, and what it was like in the early days? Yeah, well, that was definitely my career highlight for me to open that place. Few reasons. I didn't think I was good enough to open my own venue. I met David, who knew exactly what he wanted. We met at the Star of Greece in 2000. We were so like minded. One day, <clears throat> just having a conversation, one day, Shaz, 
we should open our own place. I said, what a great idea. What we wanted to create was, some, was a place that we wanted to eat and drink at. That's all. Simple, our rules, no rules, what we wanted to share with others. So when we first opened, we thought it would be a great idea to not have a menu. Let people trust us. <laughs> yeah, in 2006, that didn't work in Adelaide. It was South Australia. I don't, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great idea. Uh, so it didn't last very long. Um, so then we, we created this uh, little tiny, I don't know, menu of about eight dishes, um, but it was the most intimate restaurant. It really was, and it was all about community, you know, Pete, winemakers would walk in with bags of mandarins, duck eggs, whatever they grew that they had excess of, you know, and it was just, and that's what I love about regions. It is all about community and relationships, you know. You're seeing the winemakers, the vineyards, the producers, the growers, the farmers, you know. <laughs> it's just magical. You mentioned the importance for a regional restaurant to have a sense of place. What? What, what what was that for Fino Wollonga? Well, it was about the produce, mostly. Um, I I actually look. I I probably um, I had a really tiny, small wine list of about fifty wines, and I I um, I got a bit of grief from locals about not having uh, enough local wines or their wines on my list. Um, but for me, it was to excite the winemaker and the guest about giving them something different that they might not normally have, which was great because I won three uh, Best Small Winers in Australia and then three Hall of Fame. So, I mean, it was I, – I took a risk, I guess. Um, but to have lighter style, more interesting varieties of wine or wines with texture and skin contact, back – you know, this is – we're talking back in 2006. They're just uh, the, the the style of wines that we chose, and we uh, David and I absolutely love sherry. That was also part of the mix. They all make sense with the food that he created. It, it, it worked so beautifully. There was a synergy about what we did. You know, it's hard to replicate. You briefly mentioned that your winists have won many awards and you've won many awards over your career. Tell us about your interest in wine and, um, you know, wines of that, of um, South Australia that you, that you really love. Um, I don't know how, I don't, I think I just got kind of given a wine list back in, I don't know, the early 2000s and kind of had to learn, learn teach myself about it. Um, of course, now I absolutely love it. And the wines that I love to celebrate on any wine list um, I curate is uh, wines that have personality, wines that just are fresh and alive, wines that have texture, savouriness, handcrafted, you know, that tell have their own story. Um, because, you know, we are storytellers on the floor, of a restaurant, you know, and when you, you know, have a dish that has a sense of place, I think that wine should too. And and we make some stunning wines in Australia and South Australia, of course. So it's, it's always um, a pleasure to celebrate what we do. Um, and always, you know, I think with wineless, especially in the CBD, you know, we have to have a point of difference as a venue, you know, to, to offer a different drink or beverage experience it's really important or as you know what makes you what makes you stand out from the rest there's so much competition and so much choice out there this episode of deep in the weeds is proudly supported by olsen salt makers of australian sea salt since 1948 we take the seawater from great australian bite and then we store it in something called a primary pond. Then it's fed through a succession of ponds from anywhere between eight months and two years until it gets so heavy in brine and the water is evaporated off, the salt starts to fall out of the water and it's as simple as that. That's all that we do and then we wash it in seawater and package it. Hi, I'm Alex Olson from Olson Sea Salt. 
Salt all over the world can taste differently and that's because salt has character in the same way that a wine has character from where it's grown. So salt from the Eyre Peninsula has a very fresh, clean, crisp flavour that some of the best chefs in Australia appreciate. Eyre Peninsula is a, a really remote location and because it's remote, it's considered a very pristine area. I mean, the next landfall is the Antarctic and that pristine water makes it a perfect place to make sea salt. For more information, go to olsons.com.au. In 2014, you opened uh, Fino Seppertsfield. T- tell us how that came about and, and a little bit about the establishment. Um, David and I were working out, sorry, we're at Fino Wollonga, um, a, a regular customer was a man called Warren Randall. Um, Warren, do you know much about Warren, Mark? No, tell me. No? Okay. Uh, Warren, uh, well, he's uh, made his, well, he a, was a bulk, bulk wine um, grower. Well, he, makes, he, made, he made a lot of money making bulk wine. Uh, he was a winemaker at Sepult uh, back in the 80s. Um, most amazing character, charismatic charming man, um, kind of held court when he came to Fino, did lots of business uh, whilst dining there. He um, bought Janet Holmes a court's share of Sepplesfield Wine Estate. And I can't remember back when now, it might be a decade ago now. And he was wanting to redevelop the, the estate. And Sepplesfield, which was established in 1851, had never had a restaurant and he wanted to create a destination restaurant so he invited David and I to open Fino at Sepulsfield now for two or so years we said no <laughs> <laughs> well we said no because our life was down south you know we just couldn't facilitate or even th- contemplate how we we're going to logistically make it happen and did we, want a, did we want another venue? What were we doing? Anyway, so we thought, actually, what, a, what an amazing opportunity. Barossa is a world-class wine region. Globally, everyone knows the Barossa, more so than McLaren Vale and more so than a little town called Wollonga. So we wanted to take on this opportunity. Um, we went from a 60-seat restaurant in Wollonga to a 140-seat restaurant <laughs> in Sepulsfield. And, my God, I didn't know what I was up for. <laughs> I had no idea. No, I'm serious. I had no idea. So um, David stayed in Wollonga cooking. I went to set it up um, and kind of lived out of a suitcase for about four years Did four days on and then came back uh, to my life in uh, Port Wollonga for three nights. So it was pretty disruptive, to be honest. Um, And it was was a beast. It it was just so busy. It was amazing. But um, learnt a lot from that experience. And one of the most important things I've learnt is that be true to who you are and don't dilute your brand just because someone doesn't understand what you offer. We served so many tourists and so many internationals and they didn't they didn't want to know about my story or my brand. Yeah. And they didn't necessarily understand our shared concept. So yeah, it was just a really steep learning curve, but to stand by what you believe in and honor that. And don't deviate. It was the biggest lesson for me. And we have a brilliant, beautiful destination restaurant in Barossa, led by our head chef, Sam, who's been with us for over a decade. And my restaurant manager who's been with us, Amy, who's been with us for over five years. So a brilliant, brilliant, strong team that we've created and that we have, you know, nurtured into being beautiful leaders because it's busy. It's still busy, Huck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not surprised because the experience you deliver is exceptional. Oh, um, yeah. 
you you also opened um, you you sort of did the opposite. Most a lot of uh, operators have uh, uh, moved to the country out of the city to <laughs> open a restaurant, and you did you went the other way and opened one in the CBD. Well, yeah, because I think we've you know we opened Fino Wollongong in two thousand six. We opened Fino Sebelsford in two thousand and um, fourteen. I think we just wanted to. We've always wanted to have a presence in the city. Um, and bring that kind of regional ethos of community and provenance into a contemporary venue in the city. So, yeah, we just had a bit of we just had a bit of bad luck on the the time we opened. COVID aside, is there is there operational differences between operating a and and having an offering in the city compared to the country? Yes, but only because, well, I can only tell you my experience because we opened uh, late uh, December 2019 and then we went into COVID. So I'm, I'm staring, uh, I'm looking across the road to an empty office building. Um, the city's a bit tricky. I, I don't, it's like it's, there's more life, um, but yeah, um, there's, there is a, a, a big difference. Into just just in terms of um, the the well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think of why it's different. I I don't think the cities are the CBD is as busy as wine regions. And that's because people are getting out and about and out of the city more and not. You know. I assume so, and and I think we're still relatively new. No matter how, you know, I know that our brand is very strong and. You know, it's been around for a long time, but still, we are still a new venue. We're only a year old, essentially. You mentioned how it's your job on the floor to be a storyteller and um, talk about your, um, whether it's the wine or the food or the brand. What, what makes a great restaurant experience? Warmth, generosity, authenticity. Just delivering a really beautiful uh, a, Delivering on our story, you know, I'm, I, I'm, of course, I'm going to be. I'm not. No one's going to tell my story better than I and David, you know. Um, and when, you know, you think about a dish that's made, you know, the produce is grown with care, it's delivered with care, it's treated with care in the kitchen. You know, it is up to the front of house to deliver it to the guests with care. You know, it's that simple. And um, I think delivering an exceptional guest experience is, you know, the front of house need to have this kind of intuitive service and anticipate the guest's need needs. You know, there's a lot of body language that a lot of, you know, people, some, some front of house kind of need to work on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do because you can see I can tell if someone's feeling intimidated by our offering and you go over there and you just, you know, talk them through what, you know, you can you can see you, we can't be everything to everybody but if, you, if we as a front of house can make someone feel comfortable in an environment they not, might not normally be in, you know, they will return and they'll have a, a wonderful time. Because that's what we want. We've only got them for a couple of hours. You've been an important part of South Australia's uh, restaurant industry um, for a while now. How, how have you seen it changed over the last couple of uh, decades? I think we certainly have. I think we're standing. I think South Australia is becoming more known for our color, for our for our food and wine experiences definitely I think we're up there we always used to be forgotten <laughs> <laughs> well we, no we have you know think about the you know everyone kind of talks about Sydney Melbourne you know but I think South Australia is definitely coming into its own I think we have uh, we're more confident I think we're t we um, we're more confident we're more experimental having the the having a lot of small bars open in Adelaide's been fantastic and little you know little quirky places the beauty about going to Melbourne you know you, you can walk down a laneway and come across this gem you know and Adelaide's 
far more confident in cooking. I think we are um, delivering great experiences, actually, without a doubt, <clears throat> compared to when we, when I first started in the cafe world of the in the nineties. You know, there were lots of Ital <laughs> there were lots of Italian cafes, Huck, lots, and they weren't doing anything really, you know, mind blowing. But I think you can. I can confidently say when I, you know, suggest customers to to dine out in other venues, yeah, I've got lots of choices to give them, and 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 they deliver on different experiences. South Australia is known for some amazing wines and in, an incredible produce as well. What do you think? What is it that makes South Australian producers and their produce produce so special? Well, our, our environment, maybe, um, well, definitely the environment. Uh, I think we have the most amazing coastline from Port, from this whole Spencer Gulf, Port Lincoln, you know, th right through <laughs> down south. You know, the, the the amount, the bounty of amount of seafood we have, and we're getting more of it too since um, less is being exported. I'm about to meet um, our Pippi uh, producer tomorrow with some, you know, bluefin tuna hearts. For us to try, wow! <laughs> you know um, the the quality of poultry and beef, eggs, ev everything. Huck, it's just we are so so lucky here. You know, um, we we deal with we we have lots we have um, been dealing with growers and producers now for you know fifteen years. I have a list in front of me here of um, some of the accolades that you've received and it would probably take an episode of Deep in the Weeds to go through them all. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. But what's been some of the highlights for you and what's been some of the greatest honours that you've received? Oh, well, winning my first little small wine list um, was – my list award was my one of my biggest – only because um, – one of the gourmet traveller wine judges, Peter Forrestal, came into Fino Wollonga and, you know, I just gave him my little A4 piece of paper <laughs> as a wine list. And he's like, Sharon, I said, yes, Peter, you should submit this to a wine list award. I said, what wine list? You know, I didn't even know they were there. What wine list award? This is, I'm just this little restaurant in Wollonga, South Australia that probably no one knows about. So, yeah, to be recognised for writing a really small wine list was probably one of my highest, uh, but also to be recognised for my service. You know, um, every award, there's, there's, you know, they all mean a lot to me, Huck. Every single award, no matter where, whether it was from the advertiser in South Australia or to Best Restaurant Manager in Australia with Women in Business Awards, you know, they all have the same... I have the same emotion. I'm so p proud of my achievements. To be recognised as someone who absolutely loves what they do. So yeah, there's no there's there's no favourite little <laughs> trophy. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the challenges with the newer venue in the city because of COVID, and the the regions are, are flourishing at the moment as people sort of people step out. Um, has there been operational changes and changes um, for, for you over the last year as a result of what's happened? Uh, well, um, so if, um, because we ha didn't have the trading history at Fino Vino, we couldn't um, qualify for JobKeeper. So I have come back on full time in the city. Well, I've loved it. Uh, to, to be back on the floor, I mean, my body hates me. <laughs> My body hates me because after 30 years, you know, with uh, cortisone injections in my elbows, uh, shoulder surgery, knee surgery, all from work, you know, I'm probably working a little bit too too much, but it's been wonderful to reconnect with the customer because we, you know, we were trying to kind of phase out and we had a, re we had a full uh, team here, but yeah, from COVID we had to let everyone go. So I'm back. I'm back uh, working more hands-on. With that hands-on uh, experience like that, is it changing the way that you perceive your role as a as an owner and restaurant manager across the venues? 
Uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I I kind of didn't expect me to be in this role um, that I'm in. It's um, but it's not. It's not. It's only for the short term. So uh, the plan when we can hold our own, you know, we'll we'll employ um, a restaurant manager to lead lead the team in the future, which is a plan. So that's me working hard right now, Huck, <laughs> to make it all happen. With, with all of your experience over the years and the challenges that you've had, what, what sort of advice would you give to young people looking for a career in hospitality? <laughs> what I want to say, you shouldn't record. <laughs> don't, don't do it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do what you love, truly, because do it if you love it. It is the most rewarding industry. You get to work with booze, with food, with people, you get to tell stories, you get to have fun, you get to laugh, you get to listen to great music, but do it because you love it. That's all the advice I have, because it's hard work. It's hard on your body. It's long hours. Well, it's a beautiful sentiment, and um, as I alluded to earlier, you really do need to experience your hospitality in person because it's really something that can't be put into words. It's something that you have to uh, experience and feel um, for yourself. So I recommend anyone in uh, travelling to South Australia to get out and check out Fino. Um, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds, Sharon, to share your story today. I've loved being on. Thanks, Huck. It was such a pleasure to be with you. Well, hopefully catch up with you soon down there. and um, Please come and visit me. <laughs> um, and um, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, mate. Love your chat. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>